What on earth do Jesus Christ and the land of fish and chips have in common? Apparently, this guy, Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus' so-called lost years between the ages of 12 to 30 are a period when his activities are not recorded in the Bible. This has resulted in much speculation. Did he visit India? Possibly Japan? What about England? Why is it that ancient extra-biblical tradition holds that Jesus made a long and dangerous voyage to Cornwall where he stayed at the town of Glastonbury? What does the mysterious Joseph of Arimathea have to do with this possibility? In the words of William Blake, But most importantly, did he buy a bottle of water. Surprisingly, this voyage was much more likely than you might think. And indeed, you won't believe the most incredible piece of evidence. To understand how this might have come about, we first have to look at Jewish culture. One of the traits that made Judaism distinct in the ancient world was the expectation of some degree of literacy. This was because commands in the Torah instructed education of children, including what some Jews refer to as their greatest commandment. Deuteronomy 6.7 states, You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. From Ezra the priest in 459 BC, a handful of Torah schools were established to teach boys communally. Although a more modern understanding of universal education with multiple subjects and qualifications were not established until 64 AD by high priest Joshua ben Gamala, Torah schools were no walk in the park. Language, theology, basic arithmetic, law, history and necessary life skills were all expected to be taught, either in the Torah school or by the father of the child between the ages of 6 and 13. So, during his youth, Jesus would have been busy studying and learning the scriptures. Indeed, the last time we see Jesus in the biblical account, before the commencement of his ministry by the time he's 30 years old, is as a 12-year-old during Passover, debating the scholars in the temple who were amazed by his wisdom. The fact that at 13 you graduated from Torah school means that Jesus would have been near the end of his Torah education at that point. If you did not go on to further theological study at rabbinical school, it was expected you would take on apprenticeships with the men in your family and follow in one of their trades. Thanks to the objections of the Pharisees and the crowd in John 7.15, we know that Jesus did not pursue rabbinical school. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? But why wouldn't he have gone to rabbinical school? Matthew 15.35 and Mark 6.3 identify both Jesus and his earthly father, Joseph, as carpenters, a well-respected trade. This was a skilled role and would have made him socially more respectable than the poorest of the inhabitants of Galilee. But the family were not landed, and when Jesus visited the temple as an infant to offer a sacrifice, the Bible records the family offering two turtle doves. It was an acceptable sacrifice, but only for those who couldn't afford an actual lamb. Thus, we see that it's unlikely Jesus' family were wealthy enough to send him to rabbinical school. So, in place of rabbinical school, he would have first been apprenticed to his father as a carpenter. We also know that Joseph was never mentioned again after Jesus' appearance in Jerusalem at 12 years old. What happened to Joseph? Sadly, we will never know. But it was common practice for boys to not just be apprenticed to their fathers, but also their uncles. Extra-biblical tradition holds that Mary's extended family was quite large, including, of course, John the Baptist, whose mother Elizabeth is identified as a relative of Mary herself. In combination with the lineages of Jesus provided in Luke and Matthew, we see that Jesus came from a royal and priestly line and most likely had priestly and aristocratic family members. So, is this where the mysterious Joseph of Arimathea and chips and gravy come in? Yes, indeed it is. 
Joseph of Arimathea is identified in the biblical narrative as a wealthy man, a secret disciple of Jesus, and a member of the Sanhedrin. This was the religious council that condemned Jesus to death, albeit without Joseph and Nicodemus's support. There are tantalizing hints that this Joseph was related to Jesus. Multiple extra-biblical sources relay that Joseph was related to Mary, including well-regarded early Christian historians citing sources now lost to history. Is there any evidence for this in the biblical narrative? Actually, though scant, yes. Traditionally, members of the aristocracy would organize funerals and make space in their tombs for close family members. Well, who was it that offered his tomb for Jesus' use after his crucifixion? Yes, the same Joseph of Arimathea. He carried Jesus' body off the cross and took him to the tomb at Calvary, less than a stone's throw from the crucifixion site at Golgotha. But come on, what does this have to do with... Don't worry, we're getting there. The same early Christian historians who identified Joseph of Arimathea as related to Mary also relay with remarkable consistency that he was a tin trader. Although less reliable accounts like the so-called Gospels of Nicodemus and Peter discuss Joseph in these terms, so too do far more reliable early church historians like Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Tertullian, and Eusebius, who added a number of extra-biblical details, most likely from common third sources. So, you're a wealthy first-century Judean tin trader doing business across the Roman Empire. Where do you get your tin? Where do the Romans go to get theirs? Cornwall, of course! Although people think of pre-Roman Britain as a Stone Age backwater, more and more evidence suggests that Britain had significant social organization. The first classical accounts of exploration of Britain go back to Pythias, a Greek explorer in the 4th century BC. It quickly became an important partner in Roman trade due to its incredible tin, gold, iron and wood exports, as well as its incredible fish and chips. Arguably, this was a significant part of the reason Caesar tried and failed to conquer Britain in 55 and 54 BC, as trade had become so one-sided and Caesar wanted to exploit the wealth of Britain for Rome. It had also become a place of refuge for enemies of Rome, including Gauls who'd escaped from the port of the Gauls, where the name Portugal comes from, and France, who joined the Celts in building a counterweight civilization safely across the sea, so they thought, in the British Isles. Still, Rome would be unsuccessful in subjugating the island until almost a hundred years later. In the meantime, Cornish tin was traded across the empire and became a hot commodity as far as the East Mediterranean, which archaeological evidence suggests had strong ties with the region around the time of Christ. Joseph of Arimathea, if he was a tin trader, would certainly have sourced a vast majority of his tin from Cornwall, and almost certainly would have visited English shores and sampled a chip butty while he acquired this vital resource. Yet, the strongest evidence for Joseph's visit is a twist which we'll share at the end. So, maybe Joseph of Arimathea visited England. But Christ? Really? Well, remember he probably would have been apprenticed to Joseph of Arimathea, if not before his father's death, certainly after. Also, recall that the family of Christ are certainly no strangers to travel. According to the biblical narrative, Joseph, Mary and Jesus fled to Egypt and lived there while Jesus was an infant to escape King Herod's massacre of babies born in Bethlehem. Equally, frequent trips to Cornwall could have certainly been on Joseph's cards, and Jesus would have been expected to accompany him to learn the trade. Unfortunately, the accounts of Jesus' experiences in England are entirely extra-biblical, and many of the original sources of this information have been lost. Still, through secondary sources there are tantalizing pieces we can uncover. Firstly, surviving sources, including those of respected historians like Tertullian and the so-called first Christian missionaries to England discuss discovering churches in the south 
particularly in Cornwall, that were much older and more mature than most in the Roman Empire. The myths have Jesus arriving at port in Dorset and touring Somerset in search of new tin mines, learning to extract and refine the ore and perfecting his Cornish pasty baking skills. During this time, he spent several years with his uncle in Glastonbury, where he debated and discussed with the Druids of the time, and possibly carried out his first miracle, the Glastonbury Thorn. This is a famous tree that is believed to be the result of Jesus having dug his staff into the ground and watched it turn into a sapling. Although the original tree was sadly lost during the English Civil War, there are many descended from it, propagated through grafts. What makes this tree bizarrely unique is its one-of-a-kind ability to bloom not once, but twice a year, which interestingly can't be replicated by its seeds or simply by cutting and planting, but only by grafting the cut branches into a normal thorn. A far more limited set of sources have Jesus touring as far as Yorkshire in the north of England. Although there is no evidence at all that Jesus or Joseph actually made that trip, the fact that they were seasoned travellers means it's not entirely out of the question. Whatever happened to boy Jesus during his young adulthood, he soon returned to Judea to begin his ministry. Yet, the most important part of this full English breakfast remains off the plate. After Jesus' death, remember Joseph also took Jesus' body to the tomb. In the biblical account, it records Joseph taking vials of Jesus' blood, sweat, and tears. Later, highly questionable medieval accounts embellish this initial story recording that Joseph also took the Holy Grail, a chalice said to be the one Jesus drank wine from at the Last Supper while saying that the drink was symbolic of his blood. So why does this matter? because what happened to Joseph after he buried Jesus' body is not recorded in the Gospels. Historians cite lost sources that Nicodemus and Joseph, who were both friends on the Sanhedrin and sympathizers of Jesus, were kicked out of the council and fled Judea. Where could Joseph of Arimathea have possibly gone? Well, it just so happens that the Museum of Glastonbury Abbey tells the story. There are, in fact, records that show a certain Joseph of Arimathea buying a plot of land and settling in Glastonbury not long after Jesus' death. At the Abbey's site, recently unearthed, are the remnants of an ancient wooden structure that is believed to be the church Joseph established when he arrived in England, hundreds of years before Roman missionaries later brought the faith and discovered thriving Christian communities that were established centuries prior. Somewhere amongst the remains of the medieval Glastonbury Abbey are believed to be buried the casket containing the blood, sweat and tears and maybe, possibly, the Holy Grail of Jesus Christ. So, whether the evidence, purely circumstantial, suggests that Jesus Christ himself walked on England's pleasant pastures green, there is very strong evidence that Joseph of Arimathea did. And whether this tale does or not, Joseph of Arimathea surely does deserve his place in God's holy histories.